All right. So we're formally underway the Tuesday after Labor Day. Welcome back. So I want to show a couple of images as we get going here. And let's go to PowerPoint. So first of all, welcome back. And uh, with respect to readings that you should be thinking about uh, and have sort of uh, either reading, have read, or uh, will be reading in the next day or two, of course, the Pickett Urban Legends from 2008, the Sato Urban Expansion, and Chapter 1 in Alberti. Those are all part of the introductory section. And then uh, hopefully tomorrow we're actually going to start Module 1. And... Uh, uh, Move these pictures over here so I can see it. I'm actually going to answer your question or the question I posed to you before about why 1875 is so important in today's lecture. But I want to start with three images from this weekend. So uh, my wife and I were up in Ojai, which is this wonderful uh, community north of Los Angeles uh, in the mountains and surrounded by fantastic, twisty, curvy roads, wonderful things. And uh, this is the temperature we recorded on Sunday at about 2 in the afternoon. It was 118 degrees. And so you're never sure how uh, accurate the automobile temperature gauge is. But I went to the weather service, and that was indeed the peak temperature that was recorded in Ojai that day. And that was a record. Um, in Los Angeles County, Woodland Hills reached 122 degrees. And there were lots of places in Los Angeles that re were well over 115 degrees. And that's extraordinary heat. And what's even more extraordinary is that the heat was not generated by Santa Ana winds. So in Southern California, really our temperatures are defined by which way the wind blows, especially in Los Angeles. If the wind is coming off the water, we have relatively cool temperatures. And so if the wind is blowing... Um, from west to east, it's relatively cool. If the wind is blowing from east to west, then the winds come off of the desert, and that's when we get really hot temperatures, which will happen later this week. The Santa Ana winds will pick up, and we'll warm up again. Uh, but these numbers were generated by something called a heat dome that uh, uh, was a high-pressure ridge that formed over uh, the top of Southern California and other parts of the country as well and uh, produced record temperatures. Um, it was pretty extraordinary because the uh, relative humidity at the time that was 118, 118 degrees was 7%. So that's also the lowest humidity I've ever experienced in my life. And uh, it was incredibly hot. So, you know, my wife and I would go out at dawn and do our walking and up in the canyons and things like that and try and get back by like 10 o'clock uh, in the morning because it was just so hot. And, you know, you can function in this temperature. It's considered lethal heat. Uh, for most people, more than about 40 minutes uh, in this temperature, and you have you can generate some metabolic uh, problems. Um, but that was pretty uh, extraordinary. Did anyone else experience uh, really high heat this weekend? Did anybody try and do anything um, like highly energetic and very high heat? I did. Um, I actually went to the Melrose Trading Post on Sunday, so it was extremely hot, and we were, like, walking around, but um, after, like, 30 minutes, the heat started to, like, get to me, even though I was drinking, like, a whole bunch of water, so it was extremely hot. Yes, yes, because at a certain temperature, you can't actually replace the water fast enough. It's a little bit like during athletic events, especially endurance events, uh, you see long distance runners uh, who are working at their peak capacity. They're drinking water, but they're not actually able to replace it. It can't be absorbed fast enough because you're losing it. But it's still better to take in water because your rate of dehydration drops. But it was pretty impressive. Around three in the afternoon, I went uh, uh, outside to do just a little bit of work, you know, high, moving stuff around and things like that. And it was just, um, it was pretty impressive how disorienting that level of heat can be if you don't live in it all the time. And I think even, even if you do live in it all the time, it's a bit of a challenge. So it wouldn't have been our choice to go away that weekend, but we made reservations a long time ago. And we both, uh, my wife had to get time off from work and all this kind of stuff. So we said, we're going. And of course, the little casita we stay in was air conditioned, so it was fine. Um, I think someone's in the waiting room. They oh, thank you. Uh, 
Okay, how do I get to the waiting room when I already am starting this? If you head back to Zoom, it should be on the top right, if I remember correctly. Uh, hold on, this is strange. All right, I'm going to have to stop sharing for a second. I apologize, because then I can actually see them. I couldn't, I, I tried. I'm going to have to work on this, because I couldn't actually see them. All right, now we're going to share again. Sorry to hold you up. Okay. Thank you. So here's the second image I want to share with you. So uh, one of the great things about going to a very rural location, is some, as you all know, is that the sky gets so bright at night because it's the, there isn't competing uh, light and no street lights and things like this. So this was just a cell phone image from about 2.30 in the morning um, on Sunday morning. And I think the picture is interesting for two reasons. One, the moon is just incredibly beautiful. Um, and to the left of the moon is Mars. And even with a cell phone camera, you can see how red the Mars planet is. Uh, and it was just fantastic to watch that. And, this, and the moon was sending out these beams of light like the sun because of the particulates that were in the air because of the forest fires that are burning all around. So it's both a... Uh, a study of extraordinary beauty, but also um, a, a study of tragedy in the sense that these fires are all around us. And this is a sunset image from the mountains uh, uh, just outside of Ohio. You can see the layers, one, two, three, four, five, six layers. And uh, these are uh, the Topa Topa Mountains in the uh, Los Padres National Forest. And it's just a fantastic, this ribbon of road goes uh, if you follow it all the way around and the loop goes for a hundred miles of these twisting and plunging and surging roads are just extraordinary things to be on and the birds and the hiking trails and so forth. And so this was a place that we like to go at sunset. Um, and uh, uh, the amazing thing is, is how shrouded these mountains are. That mist is not from moisture because there's only 7% humidity. The mist is from the smoke generated by the fires. And so we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres right now in southern and central California that are burning. And because the temperature is so high and the humidity levels are so low, uh, the fires are almost impossible to control. So the hope is in this next couple of days when the temperatures are cooling off uh, and, and uh, humidity levels rise just a little bit, if the wind shifts in, uh, comes off the water, then that can suppress some of the fire that starts. Um, and the amazing thing about these latest round of fires, we know one of them was started uh, by a careless firework, but uh, lots of them were actually started by lightning. We had this strange event, as you know, about a week ago, where we had a period in 24 hours, we had 10,000 lightning strikes in California, all caused by something called heat lightning, which is uh, pretty unusual. So that was the weekend. It was uh, an amazing time to be in nature and a very humbling time to be in nature with all of the heat and so forth. Uh, just to remind us, since we've come to an agreement on the um, come to an agreement on our assessment, so we'll have two take-home exams uh, for worth a total of, of fifty points. The review paper will be worth twenty-five points, and the large group presentation, which we will actually all sign up for today, uh, will account for. Uh, another 25 percent of your grade and there's certainly time to have a conversation about that as we go forward so we'll start that with a conversation on thursday so let's jump into our conversation about urban ecology in in general this comes out of your set of readings and also uh, out of additional materials that you'll encounter later this is sort of a general introduction and here we take a look at a pie chart of the global economy. And you can see that the United States dominates with about a quarter of the world's GDP. That percentage is shrinking as China and other countries grow. Um, but we had an extraordinary period of growth just about a, a year ago where we grew by 7% in one year, which is pretty unusual. 
we call that an economic bubble and uh, 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 people like to depend on those things but uh, if compared to say this year when we actually have a, a economic contraction uh, based on the COVID pandemic and its fallout impacts uh, that was a pretty amazing year so the domestic I mean the the economic engine of the world was 85 trillion dollars uh, in that year which is just extraordinary and as we've said before much of that capacity uh, and much of that growth is linked directly to urbanization um, urbanization allows for all of these specialized ways of transacting funds think about the things you spend money on that's not food most of those things come out of technology and especially your generation is investing enormous amounts of funds in in digital capacity you, in digital capacity you can't even hold it right <laughs> it's pretty amazing to think about it it's not a thing you can hold you can hold your phone but what you're paying for is your ability to make calls and the music you download and all those kind of things and that's a highly technological and very sophisticated system of exchange and in fact, I'd ask you to think about how much of your exchange actually takes place with cash anymore. Probably pretty small. And in fact, cash itself is a representation of trust in a government. We very rarely are bartering goods directly, which was how the economy was first structured. I'll trade you some food if you'll build my garage. <laughs> then we switched to a cash system that at one point was based on gold and it's not anymore. You know, or, uh, the whole world's off the gold standard. That was in the 1960s. And now the cash is really, the coinage is worth something, but the paper is really only uh, worth the trust that you have in the government system itself. And now we don't even use paper. We just exchange with Venmo and our banks and, and credit cards and things like that. So it's an amazing system if you think about it. Um, and it's based upon the a system of trust and... Uh, and exchange and fair exchange and one of the great powers we still have as a nation one of the reason the world's uh, still calculates its currency on the US dollar is that our rates of inflation either uh, and the rates of uh, crisis are relatively low you know there are some governments where the inflation rates are 20 to 60 to 100 percent a year and our inflation rates tend to be in the single digits and in fact have been quite low uh, over the past decade. But there's no rule that says government or world economics has to be done on the dollar. And as China begins to expand even more and take over a larger portion of the uh, budget, world's budget, then we could actually use the currency of China as our, as our, trading, uh, num as our trading currency or the euro uh, as well. So it'll be very interesting to see. By the time you're my age, uh, the trends in global economics could look pretty different. And of course, that's both driven by and is a driver of these urban ecological systems. So here we see this image at night. I've shown it to you before briefly. Uh, you can go to a site called breathingearth.net, which has wonderful imagery of cities at night, as well as some other imagery. And these uh, bright spots are created by the collective incandescent lights of, of the, of, uh, the intense uh, agglomerations of where people live. So here in the East Coast, you see from Portland, Maine, down to Washington, D.C., it's really one megalopolis. It's one, really one super city. And here you see Chicago, and of course, here you see Los Angeles and San Francisco and the coastal cities and so forth, the coast of Florida incredibly bright with lights and so forth. Um, and what you see here is a hyper accumulation of people living in very, very high density. And this is a relatively new phenomenon. Although there have been extraordinary cities that go back 10,000 years. Uh, we think of uh, Baghdad, your original city there, Ur, which is probably 10,000 years old, or think of great cities like Constantinople that have stood for thousands of years. But still, until recently, the majority of the world's population didn't live in these urban clusters. They lived in rural settings and were primarily farmers. And this transformation of cities has had this incredible change of what we can do uh, as a species with respect to technology and information exchange. 
And again, we have to remember that the possibility of cities is really the result of um, uh, the domestication of plants and animals, something we'll talk about in more detail a little bit later. So let's take a look at population growth because it helps us to see in some detail uh, what, what is happening at the global scale. So we have three graphs here. Uh, one, we have the growth in total urban population living on the planet. So if we go back to the beginning of the 19th century, uh, it, was, it was very, very small. But you can see in a relatively short period of time the incredible uh, growth of people living in cities. And that trend is continuing to surge in developing nations, which are still seeing population growth. In industrialized nations, that growth rate is slowing down. There's already been an inflection point towards stability. And that's because um, the more technologically advanced your cities and the, and the nations in which they are encompassed tend to be, the lower the population growth rate. And in fact, the global population growth rate has changed extraordinarily in the past 100 years. Um, 100 years ago, the world uh, global population reproductive rate was about 5.1 children per female. Uh, and that number has dropped to 2.4, which is just about replacement rate. And so that's actually hopeful for us as we think about the future of the globe and how many people we're going to have to make room for. For, the, for those of you in the lab and you saw the film on Thursday, and for those of you who joined us, thank you very much. But make sure you watch the film Beyond the Brink. You can hear the scientists, including myself, talk about how do we prepare for a world with 10 billion people. That's about another 3 billion that, than we have now. And that's likely to be really where we'll level off. But in the 1980s, before the reproductive rate slowed down, the prediction was that by now we would already have 17 billion people on the planet. And uh, it's probably unlikely that the planet could support that many people. 10 billion, yes. And what happened in that intervening time is that there had been huge global advances with the World Health Organization, United Nations, and World Bank in increasing levels global levels of education, global levels of opportunity, especially for women. And as women have become empowered globally, and believe me, we still have a lot more work to do, but as they become uh, empowered globally uh, and, and health conditions improve, the number of children produced per family has been reduced. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about uh, urban wildlife and urban animals and, and reproductive ecology in general. But as a general trend, all organisms invest about the same amount in their reproductive output. The question is, how much do you allocate per offspring? If you're a fish that lays hundreds of eggs, you put no f emphasis in parental care. You're emphasis all in producing maximum number of eggs. When you look at mammals, mammals' offspring required enormous amount of care. And so the question is, how many offspring do you have? And prior to economic security and prior to urbanization and prior to uh, modern health interventions, the probability that, you wanted, that your children would live to adulthood was relatively low. So families had large numbers of children. But now the probability that a child will live to adulthood is much higher. And as a result, humans are investing more per child and not having as many children. And that's a natural trend globally, whether it's enforced by the government, as it was for a while in China, uh, or not. It's, it's a global trend. And necessary because um, it, it means that you know, our total Earth human population load will be less. And plus, humans are living so long. Um, you know, the, in the, in the pre-technical era, that's not unusual for people to live 40 or 50 years, and now, it's not unusual for people to live 100 years. And so that's an additional extension of the carbon footprint of each individual person. And so when we think about cities, I encourage you to think about cities as the solution and not the problem. Um, this idea of moving people into cities is how we're going to reduce our carbon footprints. 
So here's an image that you see of Los Angeles. If you're flying in from the East Coast, as I used to do when I was moving here from Boston, and you'd fly in across Fontana, you'd cross that last section of the Angeles Crest National Forest and that mountain range, and then you'd see this 40 miles of sea of lights before you land. And I have to say it's an overwhelming experience. For those of you who've either lived in Los Angeles or been coming here for years, you, you're used to it. But the first time you see it, it's really quite overwhelming the human impact. This is an image from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy that actually used to fund our work out on the East Coast. And if you go to their website, they have tremendous imagery and maps and so forth of uh, the urban footprint. And I like to start the course, the formal part of the course, with this uh, inscription that came from uh, the work of a group of architects and urban planners in Calcutta in 1990. Um, and Calcutta is one of the most densely populated and poorest cities in the world. It's also just an extraordinary city as well. And in this period of time in 1990, which seems so long ago now, it's 30 years ago, that's when I got my PhD, um, cities were still considered uh, the problem on the planet. You know, you would look at the at the crime and the pollution and all these things that were happening in urban areas and people would say, gosh, if we could just take the cities apart and have everybody move into more rural settings. And of course, you know, if you think about that challenge, if we took everybody out of cities and put them each on an acre of land, the impact would be so much more because you'd have to put infrastructure that widely spaced. And so even in a city as complicated and as poor and as uh, health challenged as Calcutta, uh, the, the uh, planners of that city in developing this charter began with this phrase, we must cease seeing the city as the problem, we must see the city as the solution. And uh, that I made a side of that and hung over my, my office in Boston for many years as I uh, would sometimes not not feel that way when you see the cities that we you're, the challenges that you were having, but it really is true. Okay, what I want to show you now, and this is one of the maps from the Lincoln Land Institute. Uh, I'm going to show you the growth of Los Angeles, and we'll go through it a couple of times because it's really quite extraordinary. And we're going to begin right around 1875, uh, and you're going to see it fill in as it there's Los Angeles in 1875. As it starts to fill in, you'll see Santa Monica Bay and everything begin to form. Uh, what do you think, maybe someone can take a guess, what do you think was important about 1875 from an urban ecology standpoint in Los Angeles? Or what could we say about the population of Los Angeles? It'll actually surprise you unless you already know. When we think of the modern Los Angeles, what's the urban term that we tend to talk about when we talk about LA? Sprawl? It's a really big city. It's a very big city. It's very, very, very spread out. Urban sprawl. So, so Los Angeles is actually the poster child for urban sprawl. But in 1875, it, it weren't sprawled yet. So. 1875 is actually when the city had the highest population density. The density has been going down ever since. The population has been going up like mad, but it's the actual uh, number of people per square mile has been going down because of sprawl. So let's take a look. So what you see here is the date, and you'll see that date moving forward in time, and you'll see the city grow. And let's go through it. We'll go through it a couple times to see the city going start of the 20th century end of the first world war population expansion then the second world war and the industrial needs of all the uh, war material production then the end of the second world war and the rise of the suburbs and then the explosion happened in los angeles And then you see it just sort of infilling. 
So beginning in the mid-1960s, Los Angeles began to expand incredibly so. In a 20-year period of time, the population grew by 50%, which is extraordinary, but the amount of land use grew by 300%. So each person was taking more and more land as they arrived. Because although Los Angeles is incredibly expensive to live in now, in the 1960s, it was actually pretty inexpensive. And people could arrive, they, there was plenty of uh, skilled and unskilled and reasonably paid labor opportunities available. You could, get, you could build your little house and you could raise a family and the weather was beautiful. Um, for the long-term Angelinos who don't like 14 million people living in their community, I say blame it on the Beach Boys, all those songs in the 1960s about the magic of California. And it was, it drew people here because of the weather and because of the topography and because of the attitude. Just the openness and uh, the idea that uh, uh, California was a land of opportunity. Let's look again. So here we see the beginning of the expansion of downtown. And then with the road infrastructure after the second, uh, First World War. Then all the labor opportunities available during the Second World War. Then the war ended and the GI Bill became available and housing loans and then the incredible expansion of the 1970s. Just extraordinary. So Los Angeles has more people in it than all of New England and all of Long Island put together. It's just amazing when you um, think about just what an extraordinary urban ecosystem uh, Los Angeles actually is. So what do we mean when we talk about urban ecology? You know, you're going to hear this term over and over, and it means different things to different people. Uh, but in a formal sense, we consider it to be an emerging and interdisciplinary science. It uses the tool of the natural and physical sciences and the social sciences put together to understand this idea of urban resiliency, to understand this idea of how cities change and how their form shifts and what functions happen and so forth. Why did we have to create this science? Why couldn't we just have regular ecology or regular engineering or something like that? Well, because urbanization itself is such a, uh, a powerful force on the planet. It's the dominant demographic trend and it's the most important component of land transformation processes on the planet. Humans now move more earth in a given year than happens in natural erosion. We impound more water than flows through rivers. And so, you know, just to say those things is just an amazing statement about our capacity as a species. But it's also a cautionary tale. We're so good at transforming the surface of the earth and harvesting its resources and channeling its energies that we have to be very careful because we're actually, at the same time we're supporting 7 billion people on the planet, we're also doing significant harm to the planet, some of which is not reparable or repairable, depending how you like to pronounce the word. Um, and so urban ecology is this combined social, physical and natural sciences tool set or tool chest that helps us to better understand how we can make the planet more resilient and at the same time improve the conditions for people who are living in these tightly knit communities. One of the great challenges that urban systems present to us is that we end up with very large populations of underrepresented people living in urban areas. And how, as scientists and policymakers and lawmakers uh, and social scientists and so forth, how do we do a better job at hearing those voices? And how do we respond to the needs of those communities? And I think, and because I'm relentlessly hopeful, uh, that urban ecology is this wonderful opportunity to revision how we engage underserved stakeholders and how we reimagine the boundaries of collaboration. You know, historically, when wealthy segments of a community paid any attention at all to those that were less fortunate, 
it was usually in the form of a direct transmission or direct transfer of some small amount of funds or resources that that folks could use and of course that's only a temporary fix so you know in the past hundred years and what is more of a uh, a resolution for positive change we've seen uh, transfers of resources in the form of educational opportunities and land transfer and protection of rental costs and things like that so that these people in these communities have better opportunities then to enter uh, middle class and, and educated as uh, enter the middle class through becoming educated members of the workforce. The next phase of thinking about this is literally engaging underserved communities and how they want their communities to be structured and uh, giving those voices uh, more amplification so that those communities can begin to reflect the needs of the people who actually live there. Uh, not an enforced set of characteristics by government agencies. And so this kind of local participation uh, really changes what we think about collaboration. So when we talk about urban forestry, you're going to hear from one of our staff people, one of the things we do at our center is that we contract with uh, underserved cities and we help those community residents decide how their green spaces should be built and where trees should be placed. And not only does that help produce, make the city more livable for the people who are most challenged, it also provides opportunity for those people to be active participants in the care and management of those communities. And when green spaces, when trees are planted, when parks are opened in urban areas, they have profound effects on the community. Crime goes down, conflict goes down, teen pregnancies reduced, incredible kinds of, of social transformations that we orig that we had previously thought were only available with, you know, more traditional uh, interventions, but just making environments green and engaging the people who live there in the care and curation of those green spaces has profound social implications, um, and so it's a pretty exciting time to be part of uh, uh, this urban ecology phenomenon. And so uh, we also have research opportunities in the uh, with tree planting ish, uh, tree planting projects. So if you if this kind of thing interests you, because uh, we host town meetings, we host uh, events where people come and decide where they want their trees planted, and information sessions and things like that before we even get to planting the trees, which we do in collaboration with this extraordinary nonprofit called Tree People, um, which have been around for forty years now, uh, planting thousands and thousands of trees in Los Angeles. Um, so if that kind of work interests you, you should contact me and you can get involved with our project. So another aspect that is um, unique to urban ecosystems is the structure. So certain things tend to happen when you transform urban, well, uh, uh, rural communities into urban ones. And we've learned by studying cities all around the world that there's a certain set of characteristics that they share. And some of them are pretty obvious, but others are not. Um, so one of the things that happens when you build cities is you fragment the habitats. You break them into smaller pieces. And we'll talk about that. I keep saying we're going to talk about this because I can't talk about everything in an introductory lecture, but I can put a stake in the ground and say we're going to come back to it. Um, so one of the things that happens when you fragment habitats is that the size of each individual critical habitat gets smaller. Why'd you do that? Each critical habitat gets smaller and uh, then actually the habitats have more edge to them and less middle. Um, and that has profound implications for uh, uh, organisms that live on ecotones and things like that. So if you, let's say you have a, a 50 acre plot of woodland and you break it up into 10 five acre plots, it ain't as good <laughs> because the five acre plots lack deep woods characteristics, which has certain kinds of humidity and temperature characteristics and attract certain kinds of animals that wouldn't be there even if there was the same amount of woodlands, but they were in smaller packets. And so um, the fragmented habitats are problematic. We see a tremendous reduction in top order predators. Uh, top order predators in this part of California would be wolves and bears 
and mountain lions. And top order predators are really important in controlling the energy flow in an ecosystem. Um, and they also change the behavior of the animals that they prey on. The animals that they prey on spend a fair amount of time trying to avoid being eaten by top order predators, which changes where they forage and things like that. Um, and in California, of course, we have some of these animals, <clears throat> but not in urban areas. Most people are not real help, not real comfortable with a mountain lion walking down Wilshire Boulevard, you know, maybe up in uh, Glendale and up in La Cañada, you'll see mountain lions coming in or in the Santa Monica's, but not downtown and certainly not a bear. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just not going to work. And so uh, when you lack top order predators, that causes all kinds of crazy things to happen. And you end up uh, having a system dominated and managed what we call meso predators or middle sized predators. Those are the raccoons and the coyotes and those kind of animals that you see now dominating urban areas. Um, they wouldn't before because they'd be eaten by the top order predators. So, very interesting dynamic change. And our lab also studies coyotes. Uh, we have two big studies right now in Long Beach and Culver City. Uh, and we're trying to understand this dynamic better. Uh, because a dynamics change because coyotes and raccoons and things behave very differently when there's bears present and mountain lions present than when they're not. And so when they're not, it changes their behavior. So we need to relearn what they're doing. Uh, we see big changes in what we call stress-related factors like temperature and nutrients. So uh, cities tend to be hotter than the rural areas they replace. There tends to be changes in water dynamics. Sometimes water is more available, sometimes it's less available. Uh, and nutrients certainly change. Sometimes there's more nutrients around because of all the fertilizers being used. Sometimes there's less, depending on the type of city, but it definitely changes. That results in changes in species composition. So in other words, that's a basic term in biodiversity that we'll learn about. Uh, species composition is the, is the set of species that are there, not how many of each one, but the species that are there, the, uh, the number of each species that are present is something called relative abundance. But species composition, what are the critters that can live there? And that changes. And once you change species composition, you change the way that energy flows, you change the way that materials flow through ecosystems and so forth. So you have to relearn the dynamics of these cities as you've changed their uh, uh, species composition. And then of course, I mean, the, the 600 pound gorilla in the room is you have human activities. And human activities have profound impacts on cities. Among other things, from the pictures you've seen before, we turn lights on at night. Cities don't get dark. And there are whole guilds of plants and animals that depend on darkness at night for their metabolism to work right. And so, um, and that's just one example. The other thing we do is we create a lot of noise in cities. And so animals can't communicate. Uh, we make a lot of noise in urban harbors and stuff, and marine life can't communicate um, through their acoustic signals. And so what are the implications for this? Um, well, what we see in cities is something very interesting. We call it uh, an increased spatial heterogeneity. And you're going to see uh, learn more about that when you read the first chapter of uh, um, that I assigned to you from Marina Alberti's book, Urban Ecology. Um, Spatial heterogeneity means how different are the ecosystems as you move from space to space. Cities are actually much more complicated than the landscapes they replaced. Because they didn't completely replace the landscapes, they added complexity to it. And so, uh, so spatial heterogeneity has become really the key idea in thinking about how cities operate. There's also a change in what we call trophic control. Trophic control is the way in which energy moves through the ecosystem and how it's regulated. So when you have a lot of top, when you have a lot of top order predators, they tend to create a top down pressure on how the energy flows because a lot of the animals get eaten. Once their life, once an animal's eaten, it's not using any more energy and so forth. In, in, in urban areas, typically, and also in rural areas, uh, for some animals, there's not enough food available. So that limits from the bottom up. In urban areas, that those dynamics change. So for a lot of animals, food and water are not limiting in urban areas because we leave a lot of garbage around. Uh, so the trophic control changes. We see the phenomenon of local extinction in urban areas. Certain groups of animals just aren't found here. And the word extinction is not technically correct to use here, but 
Um, everybody knows what extinction means, so I've used the word local extinction. The actual term, hey, does anyone know the term if you've taken it in ecology? What's the actual term for a local extinction? The silence is deafening. I hear only crickets. How about someone take a guess? Disappearance. Aiden, Aiden hit the buzzer. What's a guess? What would you call local extinction? Oh, he's muted. Sorry, I thought, uh, I guess like disappearance. Disappearance, that's a good one. Um, the actual term is called extirpation. Oh. E-X-T-I-R. P-A-T-I-O-N, -E extirpation. But if I threw extirpation up there, you guys, especially at 8 in the morning, you go, eh, it's already dull, and now he throws a word I've never heard before. So local extinction. So that's actually the, the technical scientific term is extirpation, which means in this particular area, defined area, that animal's not found anymore. Technically, extinction means it's not found anywhere in the globe. And so local extinction is a term, but the actual technical term is extirpation. And the other thing that I think is so fascinating and makes urban ecology so interesting to study is their changes in the temporal and spatial scales at which phenomena happen. I think I probably said early on in the course that the, that the typical arc of an evolutionary change in an ecosystem is somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 years. But humans, because we change the shape the surface of the earth so rapidly and change the water and the temperature so rapidly, we're changing the scales of time in which animals evolve. We're seeing rapid evolution. So coyotes, for instance, have weighed about 25 pounds, 25 to 30 pounds as adults in the worlds that they've lived in for thousands of years. And all of a sudden in the past 50 years, the coyotes that live in northern, northeast part of the United States, from New Jersey to Maine, weigh 50 pounds. They've doubled their size. That kind of evolution is unheard of. How did it happen? Well, it looks like there's been some introgression, <clears throat> excuse me, by um, wolf genes, maybe red wolf genes and so forth. But the conditions have also changed because suddenly... If you're a meso predator and you have a bigger animal that's trying to eat you all the time, your world is much smaller, meaning the areas you can forage safely. And so you're, the smaller you are, the less calories you need to survive. But if the top order predator is suddenly removed, and by wolves, I mean it was less than 100 years, wolves were just disappeared from North America, except for a few places. <laughs> They're gone. Now you're a coyote, nobody's trying to eat you, and all that food that wolves used to eat could be yours. But your head's not big enough. You need a bigger jaw. And so you have this runaway directional selection for increase in size. Because the bigger your head is, the more different kinds of food you can eat. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And so cities are like this. They're rewriting the rules. And so you see all this rapid evolution. We've seen a 10% increase in brain size in certain species of rodents in like 20 years in cities. Wow, brains are complicated things. You don't just order, it's not like pouring more pudding in a bowl. <laughs> every, every neuron in a brain has like nine other connections. You know, it's, it's, it's a difficult, complex thing to build. <clears throat> but cities are complicated things to live in. So you need to be smarter. The crows in, in urban areas know streetlights and, and they know timing and all this kind of stuff. You watch the crows that go and, and drop the nuts in the middle of the street and, and wait for the light to change and the cars run over them and crush the nuts. They wait for the light to change and they go out and get them again and bring them back. That takes intelligence to be able to do. But it also takes more calories, more expensive engine to run. But cities have more food for certain animals and so they can grow bigger brains and be more competitive in an intellectual base. I mean, just fascinating stuff. Oops. Um, <clears throat> so I think I already told you about the film Beyond the Brink. Again, some of you saw it with me uh, on Thursday. Thank you very much. The trailer is here and I've sent all of you the, um, uh, I've sent all of you the, uh, 
uh, URL to watch it. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more on Thursday. So please be, please have watched that. And uh, um, there's a lot of information there uh, that I think is pretty important because different ecosystems are limited by certain things. And, you know, some eco, some cities are limited by the amount of snow they get and stuff like that. Southern California is entirely limited by how much water we have. We actually have a lot of land uh, that's not lived on right now uh, and could support people, but we don't have the water. And uh, our water table in some areas of subsidence, it's gone down 100 feet. Um, we're, you know, we're using much more water than, than we can really afford to be using. And so the water dynamics, the ecological variability around water is what's really driving um, the future of Los Angeles and California in general, but especially Los Angeles. So I'm only going to spend a moment here. This is really talking about the opportunities that we have at the uh, Center for Urban Resilience uh, here at LMU. That's the center that I direct, and you'll be meeting more staff members throughout the semester. We do urban ecology biosocial research. We've got a coyote project. We've got invertebrate studies going on in the Biona wetlands that are all available for students to work on. And in fact, the Coyote Project, we're generating thousands of pictures. Um, Rebecca, how many pictures do we have left to analyze? Thousands. <laughs> thousands and thousands. Where'd she go? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thousands of photographs. Probably <laughs> tens of thousands. I'm sorry, how many did you think? Probably tens of thousands still. We're, we finished all the way through the end of um, June, but now we still have July and August to sort through. Thank you. So what part of what we're doing is uh, an analysis of coyote behavior and how they're using cities by putting up an array of cameras. And soon we're going to have probably 60 cameras set up and they take pictures automatically of anything that walks past. And from that, you can assemble a very, very sophisticated understanding of population dynamics. And the cool thing is, we're also doing field studies of coyotes too, but many of you are not in the Los Angeles area. You can't come and work with us, but you can analyze the photographs and get credit for it and be part of the publications that we're doing and stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's kind of cool um, that we have this particular data set to work with because we can do it remotely. Same with our some of our invertebrate uh, studies uh, as well. Uh, we're developing a podcast series called More Than Human, uh, funded by the Annenberg Foundation. And uh, uh, I think one of those, uh, yeah, you'll be listening to one of those podcasts coming up pretty soon. <clears throat> we're uh, developing a domestic animal curriculum for K through 12 schools to add to our project Urban Eco Lab, which is uh, a year long course in ecology that's being used in high schools. So these are just a, some of the projects we're working on. If you have interest in joining us, uh, we'd be delighted to have you work with us. And as I said, we also have our tree project as well. So one of the biggest challenges that we have in discussing or thinking about ecology is, especially human ecology, is the idea of, of people's satisfaction. Right, you can develop an incredible system for people to live in. But if people don't feel happy where they are, then you have all kinds of tremendous challenges. And we're beginning to understand a lot more about what it means for people to be happy and what that, um, what that element considers. Uh, the image you see in the middle here is a picture of Pete Townsend with The Who uh, many years ago. And uh, he had a chilling line in one of his early songs because uh, there was a period of time in the 1960s and 70s where the tagline was, you should never trust anyone over 30. Um, and there was a quite revolutionary period, especially in our nation's history with the uh, huge challenges in civil rights and equities, much of which we're still fighting. And uh, the Vietnam War was raging on. And uh, the chilling line in uh, the Who song that says, I hope I die before I get old. And Pete Townsend is now in his mid 70s and doesn't feel that way. He's glad he's in his mid 70s. And uh, there was a wonderfully interesting study that was done a few years ago and published no less in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is the most prestigious journal in the United States. 
So in order for a paper to be published in the proceedings of the National Academy, not only does it have to go through normal peer review, but a fellow of the Academy has to uh, nominate the paper. So it goes through the second whole level of review. So PNAS papers are really, really cool. Uh, and the psycho uh, uh, psychologist Arthur Stone was the lead, uh, was the uh, author of this paper, and it, it got a lot of uh, press, including in such prestigious uh, non-peer review, just general interest articles like uh, uh, magazines like The Economist. And here we see a uh, self-reported index of satisfaction, and you can see that. <laughs> Uh, sadly, you guys are all entering a period of your lives where there's a lot of emotional uh, tension and a lot of anxiety to uh, be good parents if you choose to have children, to be successful in your careers and so forth. <clears throat> and you can see where the midlife crisis, the term we use, comes from. Just in general, people reach the nadir of their satisfaction index somewhere uh, in their late 40s. And then as they get older, despite the fact of the physical infirmities and things like that, our satisfaction indices appear to go up. And so this natural tendency is regardless of your income, regardless of where you live and so forth. Of course, if you are healthy and have enough income, the dips are modulated. But this is a result of developmental, hormonal, ontological processes that seem to be built into ourselves. So when we think about people being happy living in cities and things like that, we have to remember that there is a natural rhythm uh, rhythm to ourselves. And you folks are going through one of the most stressful periods in your life. One of the most rapid declines in overall satisfaction because you're, you're in this struggle, this titanic internal but very healthy struggle to discover who you'll be as an adult, what do you want to do, how you will define your life, and so forth. And one of the great and also uh, I, maybe horrific things is that since you're all in college, and as I said before, since only two out of about every hundred young people ever get to attend college, you're already profoundly privileged. Uh, uh, and we're all profoundly privileged in that sense. And, and also burdened with this incredible uh, set of opportunities. What will you do? In a sense, it's almost limitless, which means that it can be very, very frightening. So it's both a recognition that being your age is extraordinarily cool, but also extraordinarily difficult. And also thinking it along the arc of the life that you'll live, uh, where you live is an important choice, but it's also your attitude about where you live is shaped also by where you are in the arc of your life. So it's an interesting interplay. And it's, we, if this were a traditional environmental course, we might not even be having this conversation. We'd be saying, well, it's clean air, clean water, clean soil. But in fact, if what we're talking about is healthy communities, then it's how people feel about where they live as well as the, the conditions under which they live. So here is looking at the phenomenon of density, which we started to talk about uh, a little bit earlier when I asked you that 1875 question about when was Los Angeles at its highest density. And here is peak density persons per hectare. Uh, here's the global average. So in overall, cities have, becoming, have become less dense. They become larger. If you add them all up, there's a lot more people there. But overall, the trend of density is going down because we have public transportation. Historically, people walked to work. And so they had to live close enough so that where they lived and work was a walkable distance. But now, especially think of, especially you who've grown up in the suburb, suburbs around cities and thought about where your parents have worked. I mean, there, there are people... Uh, uh, lots of people who travel f more than 50 miles to work every day. And so that tends to expand the city. So you can see this trend of peak density of people living per, hec per hectare. Some of it's incredibly high. You see places like Manila that were 1,400 people per hectare in the 18, uh, early 19th uh, century. And there's Los Angeles. Los Angeles peaked in eight, around 1875 with the total number of... Um, uh, people per square mile.
and you can see overall that number is going down although we still have cities like Shanghai uh, that are still living in incredibly high density and here we look at growth rates of cities uh, and this this black line would represent population growing and land use growing in exact equality. And you can see Los Angeles, its growth rate, its annual growth rate, um, was at about 5% peaking and land growth rate was at 7% per year. And you can see from the standpoint of sprawl, Los Angeles still has some of the highest sprawl in the world. It's, it, so we, we um, grow, but we also expand in size and keep adding more suburbs. Now that trend is beginning to change. There's a lot more infill going on. So for instance, the place that I live in, uh, my wife and I, it's in El Segundo Hawthorne, it straddles two uh, city boundaries and it's a con condominium complex called 360 South Bay. I don't know if any of you visit it. It's a lovely place, but they're 600 units uh, and they're quite nice and they're, they're, they're packed in, but there's lots of green space and parks and uh, it was built on the site of the old Los Angeles Air Force Base. So no new land was captured to build. So the old place was taken down and the new place was put up. And so, you know, that kind, we call that kind of growth infill or reuse, and that has the least impact. So when we were looking for a place to live, I wanted to move to a place where I felt kind of proud of the way that the Los Angeles region had used the land. So it was a brand new house. No one had ever lived in it before, but it was built on top of land that was used before. And uh, it was kind of cool. So that's the kind of growth that cities can most tolerate because the infrastructure, the water lines, and everything are already there. The roads are already there. Um, so, uh, but Los Angeles as a pattern is still growing in land use faster than um, its population growth. So here's another density plot for the United States. Uh, it sort of looks like the city uh, image at night but it's a, it's a heat map and the brightest lights show the highest density. And these were data that were gathered by Arsalan and Rachel uh, in one of the very first years I taught this course. And it was such a cool piece of work that they did. I promised them I would report on it every year. Uh, and because uh, students are always adding to this course. So the color scheme uh, makes a difference. And if you've seen this presentation before, then, then don't, if you already know it, then don't say what it is. But for those of you seeing this for the first time, uh, this is a density plot of things in the United States. And what do you think it might be? I got to open this up so I can see everybody. Somebody volunteer, I have to call on you. I have a question. Yes, Ruby. Is this like a made graph or is it yes, like I'm sorry no oh, you're, it, great question it's not a picture it's a made graph okay. so it's a density plot the things in the white are at the highest density so you know it tends to follow the cities or it looks like the roads to go across the country is it light bulbs you know you'd probably be pretty correct if you did that but these are it's actually a retail outlet Um, why is like the like pretty much the east side of the country in general way more dense than the whole west side? Oh, that's a great, great question. And that has to do with the history of settlement. Uh, and then the uh, fact you have this area out here that is very mountainous and is not so easy to traverse. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's much more rural out there. But these this area here is moist and there were lots of rivers gazillions of rivers and that don't dry up because those areas get 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 inches of rain a year and they're drained out of the Great Lakes. 
And so you have the great river systems there, the Columbia, the Mississippi, and so forth, and all their thousands of tributaries. And so the density is high there because, uh, one, the soils are really rich, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the network of uh, roads and, uh, and rivers made it easy to settle. Yeah, the boundary for the early United States was St. Louis. That was, if you go to St. Louis and see the arch, that was the gateway to the west. The west began just on the other side of the Mississippi River. And now, um, you know, the west really, the, the west really begins in this area, the so-called Intermountain West, which is still profoundly rural. Anybody going to suggest what retail outlet? Oh, there it is. Sorry, I hit the button. That represents the density of the 19,000 McDonald's restaurants in the United States. So I bring this up. It'll be the last thing we have time to talk about today. Because one of the things that urbanization has done has changed the way that people eat. Um, almost half of the food consumed in the United States now is consumed pre-made and purchased from restaurants. And that number is gigantically different than what it used to be. Uh, it also, this um, great technical transformation of agriculture and food production has also dramatically changed the price and portability of food. Food is much less expensive than it used to be as a proportion of your income that you would spend on food. So food in your grandparents' time if they weren't growing it themselves, consume somewhere around a quarter of their income. And now in a typical family, it's about a seventh of their income. Now you can spend a lot of money on food if you want to, but the extraordinary thing is you can walk into a fast food restaurant and acquire 1,500 calories, and about half of that will come from protein and meat and spend about $4. Now, not telling you that that's the healthiest food you could eat, but that's a pretty extraordinary caloric access capacity. And this tremendous excess of food we have is part of the reason so many of us as Americans are overweight. We have incredibly easy access to food. Most Americans eat meat in 17 of their 21 meals a week. And we only really need meat, if we eat meat at all, Three out, three out of those 21 meals gives you the amount of meat that you actually need for bone and muscle development, which is one of the reasons we have issues with cholesterol and things like that, because we, <clears throat> our food, even when we think about junk food, is so nutritious with the limiting things that we need, our body's just storing it in places. You know, we're storing more in our fat cells. You, when you lose weight, you don't change the number of fat cells. Each fat cell just gets smaller. And so we're just storing more stuff. We're, we, we're storing cholesterol in our blood vessels. We're, we just get all this stuff, you know, because your body assumes it's going to starve at some point because that's the way most animals live. So it's like, wow, this is great. Let's store it. Let's store it. Let's store it. And then at some point, type 2 diabetes kicks in where your body says, you're eating so much sugar, we have to reduce your sensitivity. And as fat cells get larger, it reduces your sensitivity to insulin. So your blood sugars go up so you don't digest it. If you did, you'd be even heavier. You know, you'd store, you'd store even more efficiently. So it's a fascinating system. What it means is that if we actually pare down the amount of meat consumed globally and distribute it more fairly and stuff like that, we actually will have plenty of food for 10 billion people. Our agricultural systems are extraordinary. Um, and uh, it also asks us, so historically, <clears throat> and for many animals still on the planet, and for some humans, sadly, a million humans a year still starve to death. Starvation is relatively rare compared to historical uh, numbers in humans. So we've traded the diseases of starvation like scurvy and kwashiorkor for, for the diseases of too much food like obesity and diabetes and metabolic syndrome and so forth. But even with that, we've doubled lifespan. We've doubled the lifespan of humans in the past hundred years. It's just, uh, it's a pretty extraordinary phenomenon. And we, and so, you know, and this comes about from this dynamic uh, environment of urbanization. So I'm going to